Okay, well, I want to say welcome. Can, I hope everyone can hear me. I uh, want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you probably know, we're Educational Innovations and we're all about phenomena-based science. We're always looking out for engaging new materials that you can share with your students and really get them excited about science. And today we're excited because this is our very first webinar. I think you're going to learn some great information about Google Science Journal and also how to use this technology in your own classrooms. Let me just run through a little bit of bookkeeping, housekeeping, sorry. Uh, first of all, you're all on mute. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat window. Some of you have already started doing that. And at the end, we'll spend some time answering your questions. Also, before we wrap it up, there's, there's going to be a random drawing for our Science Journal Power Pack which is a $215 retail value. So I hope you'll stay tuned until the end for, for that. Also, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So you'll get an email from us in a few days with a link to the recording as well as a link to Robert's uh, panels. And last thing, in case you haven't already answered our poll, there's a poll at the bottom of the screen. Um, we just like to know what grade, grade you're teaching. Okay, at this point, I'm very excited to introduce Robert Grover. He's the CEO of A Robotics LLC and the maker of Databot. Thanks, Don. It's great to be here. I really appreciate uh, you guys putting this together. So I've been involved in STEM education now for over 30 years. Um, I originally started teaching kids with the original TC logo materials from Lego. So I've been doing robotics and teaching coding and those kinds of things for a long, long time. Kind of dates me. But in that time, I've seen all kinds of wonderful um, um, evolutions in robotics and teaching approaches and materials. And uh, um, in the past year, a partner and, and I put together a product called Databot and our team has uh, uh, collectively been working in STEM education. You know, we had all of our years together for well over a hundred years, but uh, uh, we're really excited about this product and uh, excited about showing you Science Journal from Google, which is a remarkable product and uh, how they work together. So with that, we'll get started. Um, our webinar today, we're gonna first take a look at Science Journal and Science Journal is a free application. It was developed by Google um, it integrates with your Google Drive and a lot of your other tools. It'll run on a Chromebook, so it's got some great things that can bring to your that it can bring to your classroom. After we take a look at that, we'll get introduced to Databot itself, which is the uh, wireless sensor device that talks to it, allows students to actually capture live data, visualize it, and uh, create a portfolio. And we'll see examples of uh, both of those working together. Um, the screen captures most of them that I've done were actually done on a Chromebook, so you can see. Um, how it would look using Chromebooks. You know, the neat thing about this technology is that suddenly a Chromebook, which you typically use for, you know, your Google apps and research, can suddenly do a lot more. You can actually be capturing live data and uh, creating you know, some exciting experiments with it. We're gonna take a look also at how this applies to the standards. We'll look at a couple of content standards as well as one of the practices um, that this directly addresses. Um, um, analyzing and interpreting data is a core practice from the NGSS. Um, at the end, we'll do a Q&A session, so you'll get a chance to ask a few other questions. And then, uh, um, as Donna had said, we're gonna provide you the links and resources to get started on your own at the end as well. And we're looking forward to giving away a data bot and uh, a vacuum chamber apparatus, which you'll get to see in this um, um, demonstration today. So let's start with some Science Journal. What is Science Journal? As I mentioned, it's a free application. It's available on Android and iOS devices. You know, at the end of this um, um, program, you can actually download it to your iPhone or your Android and play with it and start doing some of the things that, um, that uh, I'm gonna show you today. Um, when it was designed, um, um, Science Journal was created to actually take advantage of all the internal sensors on um, smart device devices, okay? So for example, if you have an Android tablet or an iOS um, you know, um, iPad, those would work with Science Journal and you would be able to access the sensors that are built right into those devices. And it's amazing the amount of sensors that are built into your smartphone. You've got an accelerometer, you'll have a light sensor, sound sensor, all kinds of things. 
Now, the neat thing about uh, what's happened over time is that Science Journal also now opens up and can connect to external sensors like Databot. And to summarize, you know, um, Science Journal basically is what it sounds like. It uh, is an interactive multimedia science portfolio builder. So kids can take pictures, um, they can add notes. So it, they're, they're called observations. You create an experiment, you go through and you have different types of observations you can create. And uh, those include typing notes in, um, taking pictures, and most exciting of all, of course, is to uh, grab actual live data, visualize it, record it, and then uh, make commentary and observations on it. One of the things I like to point out, since it is a Google product, that um, it does sync with Google Drive. So if you're a Google school and all of your students have Google logins, when they log into their Chromebook um, and they start using Science Journal, it will store all of their materials right onto that portfolio. And uh, um, since it's living on the Google Drive, regardless of what Chromebook they might log into in the future, their portfolio is going to be right there, which is really nice because it helps organize um, you know, their assets and all of the things that they've been doing. It's not difficult to chase those files down. Now for um, using it on Chromebooks, um, you, you are required to be able to run Android apps from the Play Store on your Chromebook. Now some of the older Chromebooks won't do that. So for example, um, the HP G4 is a, is a unit I just ran across at a, at a local school. And it was before the time that uh, the hardware was being um, aligned with the Play Store. So anything newer than, than that, there is a list of hardware and your IT personnel need to probably get involved to get your um, district um, on board and get it set up so that you can access those apps. But once it's activated and you've got it running, and if it's a Chromebook that's two years newer, um, you know, relatively new, um, it should work fine. And again, as I said, the, um, um, some of the screen captures I've got here, for example, this one is straight out of my ASUS Chromebook. And on the right-hand side of my screen, I captured the whole desktop there. You can see a, um, uh, an example of a portfolio of science experiments. And it's really cool. You can take pictures of your apparatus or maybe a person you're working with, or you maybe you want to come up with a cool um, image that will um, profile your picture or your experiment. And you can add those to your portfolio. So again, it syncs with your Google account. Um, regardless of where you log in, um, that account is going to come up and show you your colorful portfolio of science um, experiments. So it's a great way for kids to actually start to build you know, a science journal that includes a lot of multimedia and fun things. It makes data and it makes science really engaging. So let's go ahead and give it a try here. I'm gonna um, pull up this next screen, which actually shows you the process. So when you open Science Journal, we'll go back here real quick. When you open it on your Chromebook, you'll notice down here in the lower right-hand corner, there's a purple plus sign. That's where we create a new experiment. And that's where all of these, of course, originated. So if we were to click on that, the first thing you'll see is this blank screen that says, hey, we've got a new experiment and it has no observations yet. There's different types of observations again. So you've got a text observation where you can type in notes. You have a um, data gathering observation. That's what this little circle with a squiggle through it is. You got the ability to take camera um, images and then also upload images. So to start building our portfolio, we um, type in some text. It's pretty small, but you can see I've typed in something there. We click the blue arrow, and then your next step is to see that added as an actual piece of your experiment. So these observations accumulate um, in a linear fashion. You know, the more observations you add, whether they're pictures or notes or data, they're all gonna be in a sequential format here. So very simple to use. Um, and that's one of the nice things about it for um, especially elementary and middle school science. It's not intimidating. There's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of setup and things like that. Kids can actually be capturing data quickly and uh, starting to analyze it and, uh, and having fun with experiments. Now this is an example of actually capturing some data and what it looks like. So when we click on the, um, uh, data icon. So remember, this is the text icon. This is our data gathering icon. We select that and it's going to come up with the um, sensors that are selected. You have a menu in there where you can select which sensors you want and which ones you want turned off, which we'll look at here in a few minutes. But by default, it'll normally come up with um, a sensor selected. If you're using an iPhone or um, an Android device, 
it'll probably come up with something like the um, sound intensity, maybe the ambient light if it's a phone. Chromebooks only have typically a um, microphone in them, so that's about the only um, sensor you'll have access to until you connect to a data bot. But here we've opened up and you can see it's displaying pitch and it's also displaying sound intensity. Very simple to capture an observation that'll add to your experiment by just clicking on um, the record button here. And then you click on the little square button when you want it to stop. You'll notice that the screen is highlighting the data as you save it. And then um, up here, you'll notice now we have a recording that's been added. And again, that's how you start to build your portfolio, just one step at a time, notes, pictures, and data. So quick review of um, Science Journal. Again, remember students can build very colorful portfolios. That's one of the biggest um, assets of it is it's just very approachable, friendly, and uh, colorful. So it brings um, activities that you're doing to life, I think, through a lot of visual and uh, you know, active um, observations. And remember, you can take um, physical notes, you can record data, and you can do pictures. And then finally, again, really, really powerful. It syncs with your Google Drive. And here you can see an example of a couple of recordings. So, so now that we've uh, taken a quick look at Science Journal, let me see how much time we've got here. Let me make sure we've got enough time to get through everything, including looking at some actual samples. So Databot was designed to work um, with a lot of different types of software. And Google Science Journal is the one that we selected for it to work with out of the box. This is a Databot right here. You can see how small it is. It um, fits in the palm of your hand. They're very, um, they're very friendly and actually quite pretty. You know, the uh, um, uh, designer behind them um, um, came up with some really good ideas, both on the electronic side and then our um, creative um, director in terms of how it should look. So it's quite beautiful. Kids can actually um, see through um, the polycarbonate case. You can see the sensors inside, the lights. It has physical computing um, attributes. So for those who want to actually teach coding, you can do that with it as well. It'll light up and squeak and squawk and all kinds of fun things. The sensors that are included um, with Databot are pretty extraordinary. The fact that we've gotten all these things packed in this little box is what's really exciting. And it's inexpensive compared to typically the kinds of things that you would have to do to get access to sensors. So just quickly, you know, you've got an external temperature probe, which plugs um, into one of the ports on the top there, um, right here, actually. And uh, that's something that you can drop into a beaker or a stream to take temperature readings. It's got a built-in humidity sen sensor, uh, reads um, ultraviolet A, B, and the index. Um, you can sense ambient light, it reads in lux. Um, it's also got an air quality sensor on it, which uh, reads carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds, there's a physics package, which has the accelerometer, gyro, magnetometer, and then of course you have a sound sensor and an air pressure sensor, which is also the altimeter. So you can determine altitude from the air pressure. Um, it's also got a Bluetooth connection built into it. So on the back of this device, there's a Bluetooth chip, which uh, uh, blinks as a beacon until you connect to it. And then you can actually use it um, with things like Science Channel, which is what we're gonna take a look at next. This is a quick look at what comes in a Databot package. So these are the different tools. This was the uh, um, probe I was mentioning. So you can see your little um, aluminum cased temperature probe here. That plugs into this port and allows you to take external temperature readings. There is an SD card, eight gigs of memory that's built into this that uh, you can store data remotely on. And then you can take that out, put it into the little reader that's provided, and you can open that data up in any spreadsheet, any analysis software that you're used to using. Also comes with a um, lanyard, so you can actually clip onto that, wear it around your neck, swing it for physics experiments, all kinds of fun things. Um, on the bottom of this, which you can't see, there are hooks physically for connecting it to Lego, Fisher, and other building systems. Also comes with a Velcro plate, which allows you to connect it to just about anything else. We've stuck it on Frisbees and drones and all kinds of fun things to do experiments. So those are the, uh, that's the toolkit that you have to work with. And then when you're working with Databot, these are some examples of it in the field. Um, we did some great activities with kids at a local charter school launching it on Estes air rockets. And you can see we added a little bit of bubble wrap here. Um, Databot is incredibly rugged. Um, it's been dropped, kicked, um, put inside Nerf footballs, um, 
launched on rockets and uh, it's survived very nicely. So we've been really impressed with how tough it is. Um, so it will survive um, a drop onto the classroom floor. Um, shouldn't be any problem at all. We don't recommend, um, you know, using a slingshot to launch at 60 feet, although we've done that, but uh, um, it's pretty tough. I think you'd be pleased with it uh, when you get a chance to use one. This um, Chromebook rocket launch over here, just to give you an idea of how this whole process worked, you can see down here in the lower left-hand uh, corner, kids using a Chromebook to actually look at the data. And then we've got one student over here um, attaching the data bot. We were getting ready for our launch. And then during the launch, you can see the actual data that was captured. So um, in real time, you actually can see the rocket going up. You can see the um, velocity, um, acceleration. You can do all kinds of interesting calculations about, uh, um, you know, we were doing um, the force equals mass times acceleration formula. And uh, so they weighed the rocket, they weighed the data bot. Um, there are a lot of interesting little attributes of that experiment, but it was very visual. That was one of the neatest things about it is you could actually see the data that you were collecting and uh, you could see immediately how high it went. Um, the readout for the altimeter was working up here. Here you can see that uh, this is where we actually lost the connection to the Bluetooth. And uh, that also was a good teaching moment, you know, your rocket's out of range, um, so you've lost your data connection. But uh, uh, a lot of excitement there, a lot of hands-on and uh, really good, um, you know, in interaction with physical data. The image on the right here, this is a fun one also, um, using it to capture um, UV rays. So the UV sensor is right on the front. You can tip and tilt this until it aligns with um, the sun perfectly. You have a little sight actually that shows up and you can get really good readings on ultraviolet. And there's some great activities on uh, using the ultraviolet sensor for you know, teaching kids about harmful sun rays, um, how the Earth's atmosphere protects us from ultraviolet, the different types of ultraviolet. Since you're reading both A and B, um, it's a great opportunity to talk about the different types of lights, about the electromagnetic spectrum, all kinds of fun things. So to connect to Databot with Science Journal, checking our time here, um, is very simple. We've created an, uh, an application that lives in the Google Play Store as well. Um, it's called Arduino Link, and you'll download it to your device, your Chromebook, your smartphone. And then when you run that, um, it's gonna show up with a little window here and it'll display all of the active data bots. So like here we've got one data bot displaying, it's showing the signal strength. You can tell which data bot you're talking to because the one that's closest to your device will show up at the top of the list. When you click on that, it'll connect to um, the data bot and um, um, sensor data will start streaming. And then within Science Journal, that's where you can go grab um, different sensors from data bot and start using it just as we looked at in the very first uh, portion of this webinar. So here, um, this is actually how you do it inside Science Journal. If any of you actually have it on your phone or you've used it before, you know there's a little icon here that uh, looks like a little gear and that will open up your sensor settings menu. And here in this display, you see all of the different sensors from Databot being displayed and you select the ones you want and then uh, um, you hit the return button here and it'll take you to your experiment. So um, here's a simple um, trial experiment that I've done many, many times with uh, um, kids and adults, frankly. I go into that sensor settings menu and I select CO2 and I select humidity, um, both of which of course we produce when we exhale. And uh, um, I challenge students to produce the highest level of CO2 possible, which always starts some interesting conversations. Well, how can I increase um, the readings of my CO2? You know, the first thing is to take a look at actually what um, kind of readings you get. So this um, um, video actually will show you what the um, readings look like as you breathe on it. So the CO2 is reading out in parts per million. And then of course your relative humidity is in a percentage. And we'll just, uh, whoops, what happened there? Should have a video play, there we go. And you can see that the, um, Readings are spiking as I'm breathing on it. Now, if you get really good at this, you can get readings um, clear into the tens of thousands. In fact, the competitions I've had with kids is, is fantastic. They'll, they'll learn that if they hold their breath, they'll actually um, be able to produce higher amounts. They'll discover that uh, um, uh, by cupping it in their hands, um, they might get a much juicier um, reading, you know, in terms of humidity. So it's a, it's a wonderful, very hands-on experience again with data. 
Um, just an aside, we're going to look more at uh, science standards here as we get uh, through this next activity. But this one's a very good example. Just using this activity, um, you're highlighting how energy um, um, and uh, um, matter and energy flow through um, you as a human and how actually the processes within you are converting things like oxygen to carbon dioxide and so on. So again, this is a very visceral and uh, um, you know, real example of kids seeing data that represents that process taking place. So next, let's take a look at this experiment. This is a really fun one. And this is actually part of the giveaway power pack. Um, um, Educational Innovations has a, um, a vacuum chamber kit, which is really cool. And you'll see it here. This is the uh, picture of Databot sitting next to it. So you can kind of see the scale. The way the chamber works, um, you, you put this jar over the top of the seal. You use the um, syringe to pump the air out, and it uh, does a fabulous job. It reduces the internal air pressure very quickly. And then using that, of course, you can do some interesting experiments. Well, we were very delighted to find out that Databot fits precisely inside um, um, the little globe, which you can see there. And uh, this was one experiment that we did with it. So, and this was probably one of the most fun. So what we did is we put, uh, uh, of course, you use Science Journal and you set it to be reading the sensors of sound intensity in this case, and then also air pressure. There's a very uh, annoying buzzer that's inside the vacuum bell jar there. And then um, as we pump the sound out, you'll actually get to see what happens. And I have that recorded in the next one, but this, is, this will give you an idea of what the sound is like. Very annoying, there it is. And there's the apparatus that we pump. So now, um, as we pump the air out, this is, this is the actual activity that we do with kids on this. Um, very simple, you have just those, um, those items to do it. And what happens is kids are going to get an opportunity to see firsthand how air is acting as a medium to transfer sound. Because of course, as you're removing the air from the vacuum chamber, um, there's less and less medium for the um, sound waves to carry through. And uh, that's one of the um, um, science standards, of course, that uh, is very important. It's the um, four point A wave properties, which uh, you run into a lot within the NGSS. And uh, this actually shows kids um, one of the specific attributes of that um, standard by demonstrating that when the air disappears, um, there's no sound. And uh, these are some of the activity questions that we do with the kids. So. This is actually getting them to think about it. You know, you do a um, you do a preliminary set of questions. You know, what do you think is going to happen, and so on. And then after you do the experiment, these are the follow up questions. And uh, let's go ahead and watch the video so you can see the actual um, change in data. And note one of the questions here is why does the sound level seem to be jumping up and down? And of course, that is coinciding with the strokes of the syringe as we're pumping it out. So the air pressure is actually jumping up and down, as is the sound. And you'll notice a steady decrease in the sound intensity as we remove more and more air. Stop. So again, great activity, really simple to conduct and uh, um, immediately shows kids um, something very important about sound. It requires a medium. Um, some of the curriculum we've written, we um, include misconceptions in all of them. And one of the common ones here was, you know, sound can be heard in space because we have all those great science fiction um, fighting scenes where you have explosions in outer space. Well, in reality, there's no sound because there's um, no medium to transmit the sound, which is always um, kind of a dismay to kids when they realize, wow, there's no sound out there. But a fantastic way to um, convey that very important science standard. So a little bit more on NGSS, let me check our time here. We've got a few minutes left, so I think we're doing fine. Um, so you've got your, um, you know, your core ideas within the NGSS, and then you've also got your practices. And practice number four, analyzing and interpreting data, is um, critical, of course, for kids, especially in today's society. We need to be able to prepare kids to be um, um, you know, careful about what they take to be um, true. Uh, we have to teach them to actually be analytical, to discern the different kinds of data that they're getting, the kind of news that they might be receiving, and get them to the point where they're going to investigate on their own so that they have 
their own faith in their observations and their final conclusions rather than just listening to what somebody might tell them is true. And that's what this practice is all about, learning how to look at data, interact with data, analyze it, and finally come to conclusions. And so again, that's where the combination of Databot with Science Journal is such a powerful combination because they're actually gathering data, they're accumulating that data in a portfolio, they're making commentary, they're jumping to conclusions on different things and then realizing, oh, gosh, that's not right, and then they amend it later. You know, it is an ongoing portfolio and developing experience of what they're learning and, uh, and taking away from their um, experiments. One other thing about standards, um, I've highlighted one of the ISTE standards here because this one is obviously directly aligned with uh, what we're talking about. Um, 3C here, um, students curate information from digital resources using a variety of tools and methods to create a collection of artifacts that demonstrate meaningful connections or conclusions. And that's exactly what Science Journal is all about, um, is building, you know, that portfolio of, of artifacts. I've got one more activity I'm going to show you, and then we'll have a few minutes um, for the giveaway and, of course, questions and answers. And this is uh, an activity that we selected so that you would have something that you could actually, um, if you've got Chromebooks, you could go um, back to your classroom and do right away. You don't need a data bot. Um, you just need to download and get um, um, your Chromebooks running with um, um, Science Journal. So the way this works, you introduce, uh, first of all, with all of the sensors, when we introduce them to kids, we start out with um, units of measurement. So what is it that uh, we're actually looking at and what is the unit that we use to measure that? And in this case, for sound intensity, we use decibels, and that's what the readout is on your, on your menu there. Um, this experiment is a lot of fun because it teaches kids about sound intensity, which of course is the, what we call in common language loudness, you know, how loud is a sound, that's the intensity. And you use your uh, microphone on your Chromebook to record and uh, visualize that data. And this is a fun little activity. So it's called Etch-A-Sketch with Sound and very straightforward. You can see what they're doing. Um, you give them some challenges um, in terms of um, sound. Can you draw the following things with simply sound? And you might make that sound by humming. You might have other sources of sound, but you're challenged to make these different shapes. And uh, this is a great activity. It's a great one to get kids very familiar with, first of all, with decibel levels and also just with the general terminology of intensity and, uh, and of course all the things that come along with gathering data. So the data game is a framework that we use for a lot of things like this, um, providing kids with challenges that are quick and easy, but they typically convey something which is like the units and get them familiar with uh, the sensor itself and the kinds of things you can do with it. So I think we're down to just a few moments here. We've got about three minutes left. I'm gonna move on to um, um, Q&A time as well as the giveaway. And uh, Donna, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we do. Let me see. The first question is uh, from Francis Kovschek and sh the, the question is, when Databot loses connection, will the internal memory still collect the data? Yes, what happens is uh, um, actually Databot will reconnect once it comes back into range and it'll start picking that data up again. And it just depends, you notice the little red screen that shows up when you're recording the data. Typically you only take, um, you know, uh, you might take a 10 or 20 or 30 second data reading and collect that and make that an observation. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, we had another question. Um, well, Tammy has been answering some of these questions, but I'll, I'll ask them in case people aren't reading the uh, chat. Are most of the topics prepared lessons to use Databot? Yes, there's a number of activities that are already prepared and online. A lot of uh, what we're working on right now are what we call sensor starters. And it's a series of activities that walks you through each sensor and provides you three different activities within the data game to get started. And then we have other activities that um, um, are under construction and they all surround um, the different sensors as well. So for example, we have a group of activities called I'll huff and I'll puff, which is all about CO2. So those are under development. We have a lot to get started with. The other thing with Science Journal is that there's over 70 activities already authored just using Science Journal that are available. So there's a lot of activities that uh, you can look at and draw from. Okay, uh, we have another question is, 
that the Margaret says, she, we are not a Google school. We use Microsoft instead. Would we be still able to use this program? Yes. Now you won't be able to use um, Science Journal because it doesn't run on Windows, but you would be able to use Databot and it works with a product called Data Streamer. Let's see if I get back to that. Um, Data Streamer is a Microsoft initiative. They have a program called Hacking STEM and Data Streamer is an add-in for um, Excel that allows you to actually connect to live sources of data like Databot. Um, a local um, physics program here um, in Boise where I'm at is actually using Databot for their um, physics and life science activities and using Excel um, because they have all um, Windows laptops as well. Okay. Uh, screen captures here are an example. You can see the um, sensors from the CO2 and on this one, just the Lux sensor. And they actually are streaming data in on those columns and you'll see it charting in real time as you create your graphs. Okay. We have a lot of questions just now coming in, so we, we're going to run over a little bit, but they're great questions. Uh, one question is, uh, what is the highest concentration for CO2? That it will read? That it will read. Yeah, it has a very high um, level, so over 30,000 parts per million. Okay. What is the temperature range for the external sensor? Mm, I don't know that off the top of my head. Now, um, in this um, presentation, which we'll send out to you afterwards, um, these are the technical data sheet links, and uh, you can go to those to get the exact range and uh, um, technical specs on each sensor. So that's provided in this follow-up information we'll send you. Um, let's see, one, what is the ideal group size for these types of activities? Would you recommend having one data bot per class? or better to have multiple, i.e. one per small group? Yeah, probably, you know, the class pack we sell has 10 in it. And uh, I think one of the best combinations is, is couples, you know, two, two students working together, where one, for example, will be handling the portfolio, recording the data, um, the other student might be doing the activity, whether it's throwing data bot in the air, or doing swinging it, or launching it, or uh, capturing temperature data, those kinds of things. Okay, uh, can I hook this to vernier probes? Vernier probes. Vernier probes will work with um, Science Journal, some of them. I think their wireless ones will connect to Science Journal. So there's been an integration there. Okay, what is the standard sampling rate? Can sampling rate be changed? How long can data be taken at max rate before the memory is full? You know, you can take an enormous amount of data and um, for those people who are doing more advanced things and they want to modify the sampling rate, the sampling rates for um, Science Journal are set because we wanted it to be very simple to use again out of the box. And uh, for people who are doing advanced things, you open up um, a script in what's called the Arduino IDE. And uh, Databot is, is essentially an Arduino um, device, which means it's a little microcontroller. And you have the ability to open scripts, um, change your sampling rate, um, so you can do long-term samples and write to the eight gig card. Eight gigs of memory um, will hold an enormous amount of data. Um, it just depends on what your experiment is that you want. Okay, there's a couple of questions that are in a similar vein, so I'm gonna throw them together. Um, will this work with a Raspberry Pi or other embedded system? Also, you've mentioned Chromebooks quite a bit. Will Databot work along with MacBooks? If you want to use it with a Mac, you can use the Arduino IDE again. Um, so that software is available. Um, Science Journal on iOS we're working on. So that should be available probably next year. I don't believe it'll be ready until after the first of the year. Um, let's see, what was one of the other Raspberry, questions? It was Raspberry Pi or Raspberry. other embedded systems. Yes, yes. In fact, um, you know, the expandability on Databot is tremendous. It's got um, two different ports there in addition to the temperature probe. One is an open port for analog and digital, digital sensors. So it's IO, you can light up um, LEDs, you can take other data in from different types of sensors. And then the third port there is what's called I squared C, which is a communications protocol that allows you to connect it to all kinds of things. But yes, you could directly connect this to your, I, to your um, um, Raspberry Pi, use it as a slave device, for example, gathering data that the Pi is, uh, is calculating, visualizing, or doing other things with. 
Okay, great. Uh, just one more, I think, here. What about IFTTT? Can my computer science students write embedded solutions to continue or extend their learning? Yes. Now, there's uh, again, using the Arduino IDE, you can uh, program it to um, have physical computing exercises. Now, um, you know, Databot's quite new. We're working on integrations with Scratch. So if you're using Scratch as a coding language, uh, Blockly is another one. Uh, but using the IDE, you can immediately start with physical computing. In fact, we provide some samples. So if you're a technology teacher, um, you can program Databot to light up when you breathe on it. So um, it picks up the elevated um, CO2 levels. You could throw it in the air and have it squeal. Uh, it's got some really brilliant LEDs built into the base and a full spectrum speaker. So you get all those fun physical computing um, um, outputs as well as, um, you know, the sensors. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, that, that, this has been really informative. And as you can see, Databot and Google Science Journal really have a lot to offer. Um, the screen that you're looking at now, oh, that you were looking at what shows our phone number and, and if you have any additional questions or would like more information, you're welcome to email us at info at teachersource.com. Call us at 203-748-3224. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending you a follow-up email with a link to this webinar recording as well as uh, Robert's slide, slide deck. So now we're ready to give away the prize. Um, all of you who are still here are welcome, are eligible to win the Science Journal Power Pack. That's the Databot along with all of its sensors and the microscale vacuum apparatus that Robert has just demonstrated. So I'm doing this totally randomly. Um, I'm scrolling up and down. I'm just gonna click on whoever name, whatever name shows up for me. Um, and it's Terry Wilson. Congratulations, Terry Wilson. Gotcha. I will reach out to you by email this afternoon uh, to arrange for your power pack. And uh, so um, that's that. I, I was waiting for this part of the of the webinar all day. So I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on on this webinar. It was our first, and we're really excited about offering more of these sessions in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and enjoy your day. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Donna. Absolutely. Goodbye everybody. And Terry, I will be I will be in touch. <laughs>